Yeah, no. He just, I know. I want to I want to get the signal from him. A very special good evening to you. We want to thank you so much for joining us on this very special program tonight, right here from the studios of the Government Information Service in Bathurst State. Tonight we're going to be having a very special discussion, and the topic tonight is going to be Dominica since independence, politics, and foreign affairs. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you in the audience and also take the opportunity to welcome my guests, my two esteemed guests. Uh, let me start at my, to my extreme right, Dr. Philbert Aaron, who is the ambassador, Dominica's ambassador to Venezuela and to Alba, if I got it right, and also Dr. Lennox Honichich, who is a household name in Dominica for many, many decades now. Gentlemen, welcome to the studios of GIS and, of course, all the people listening on DBS and Kyrie FM and those listening to it via the streaming service of Kyrie FM as well. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We have been um, hearing a lot about Dominica's independence. And um, of, of course, everybody would know by now, we are hoping, should know by now, that Dominica attained uh, political independence from Great Britain on the 3rd of November, 1978. Uh, since that time, uh, we have seen the country having a, had seven prime ministers. The current prime minister is the seventh. And of course, uh, it was felt that uh, we uh, had an economic independence. A lot of people felt that um, we had still not gotten full independence from Great Britain since um, everything that had to do with our final court of appeal um, still uh, lied with the United Kingdom and the law lords there. In recent time, Dominica has um, signed on to the Caribbean Court of Justice in its full jurisdiction, its appellant jurisdiction. And thus, in the minds of many people, we finally caught the last naval string that, was, that kept us tied to Great Britain. And we can see um, from a position of strength and fact that we are now fully independent. Since um, Independence, though, uh, we've had, like I said at the top of the program, a number of uh, prime ministers, seven to be exact, and we've seen a number of political moves being made um, in, in, in many areas, in many spheres, in many veins, um, and for various reasons. That has sort of, in, in my view and in the view of many people, laid the platform for a number of things that we um, uh, experiencing today a number of uh, our, our, our uh, moves economically and s pretty much so in the area of foreign affairs. Tonight, Dr. Aaron will be dealing strictly with um, the issue, the, the political moves, looking at the various political moves, which um, has, Dominica has sort of engaged itself in and with from 1978. And Dr. Honeychurch will be dealing with the foreign affairs and um, sort of seeking to show the, the synergy between uh, the political moves and, 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 and that of foreign affairs. I want to start with Dr. Aaron, um, as I allow him um, the first few minutes to introduce um, his part of the discussion, and that is Dominica since independence, the political moves. Dr. Aaron. So one, of the, um, one of the critical things is the, the political development of Dominica. Uh, independence itself is a, a milestone in political development. That is, uh, Dominica moves from being a colony and gets uh, the, the next 20% of its sovereignty, which is uh, something we'll be discussing for in foreign affairs, as well as control over defense. And uh, also, the, the, what you just mentioned, uh, Dominica signing on to the CCJ, the Caribbean Court of Justice, another aspect of um, Dominica's political development becoming more and more mature, more and more grown. Uh, there are smaller milestones um, between and among those, those larger milestones. And uh, overall, uh, in, in the period of independence, uh, Dominica has firmed up what it means to be Dominican what it means to be Dominica. And in the process, the chief political position in the system 
prime minister, the position of prime minister, uh, which has been occupied by seven different individuals, that position has strengthened. That position has gotten uh, stronger traditions. Uh, there are greater expectations by the people on that position. And the position of prime minister is a major, major influence on the development of, of the country overall, political, economic, and otherwise. And of course, a major determinant of foreign policy. I think um, Dr. Ren has sort of put into sharp um, perspective here uh, what we, some of the issues that we're going to be addressing as it relates to our evolution, so to speak, as it relates to um, post-independence, the prime ministers and, and, and uh, some of the, the, the political maneuverings. Um, let me also just take the opportunity before I introduce Dr. Onichesh to um, tell the, the, the viewers and listeners that at some time later down in the program we will be entertaining your calls. Um, the number to call, the number that we'll be asking you to call is 440-7655, is that it? Um, I'll probably get that number correct for you, but it's 44076, um, whatever, I'll tell you later on. Uh, however, we will be entertaining your calls a little later on. Dr. Honeychurch, Dr. Aaron, um, in his brief introduction, <coughs> spoke about um, what happened to us since independence in terms of our political, um, one may say, if you look at it, in <laughs> if you refer to a child, our political upbringing mm -hmm. since independence. And, um, I know uh, a, lot of, a, a lot of what happened uh, uh, and still is happening in, in, in the area of foreign affairs today um, has its bearing or its foothold in um, some, if not all, or most of the political moves. Uh, your task with the, with, the, with the responsibility tonight of, of discussing the issue of our foreign policy. And so I will allow you now to um, introduce yourself and introduce your, your aspect of the discussion. Well, basically, I mean, what we have to understand is those various processes we went through. Um, we begin it in 1967, because in 1967, Dominica received, you could say, 80% of its independence. As um, uh, Aaron here has said, uh, you have 20% which was left on independence. That was defense and foreign affairs. So we were self-governing, except in those areas of foreign affairs and defense. Back in 1977, once when I went um, on a visitor program given by the State Department in the US, in May 78, actually, we had not yet gone independent. When I was taken to the United Nations, I was escorted, shown around by the British, because the British were responsible for us, anything doing within foreign affairs. So uh, it wasn't until the following year after independence that we would go and establish our own um, uh, offices, our own position within the United Nations. So, however, even within that local concept of uh, uh, self-government, there were elements of foreign affairs, like foreign investment, that the Dominican leadership could negotiate with and do for. Um, I have a few slides here. We can maybe quickly go through them. I'm not sure if they're ready um, in relation to understanding what associated statehood is about. Because I see my role here this evening basically kind of in an educational manner to, to deal with these issues. So we have those areas where we are beginning to deal with aspects of foreign exchange like foreign investment. Uh, we had the case, for instance, of the uh, Sunday Island Port Authority where we handed out by law the whole of the coverage. You know, <laughs> recently there was a fuss about 50 yes, acres. Yeah. But the um, Sunday Island Port Authority Act of 1968 basically handed to the authority the entire 260 acres. And this individual called Bruce Robinson was going to go to the United States and negotiate for funds to invest in this. It so happened things went away and he wasn't able to get the money. The following year the law was repealed and basically the land went back to government. But it just shows, you know, the kind of aspects of foreign relationships that were still permissible. Another one that was important to us during that early period, 1968, the setting up of CARIFTA. And in 1973, the movement to CARICOM under the Treaty of Chagaramas. Now, those were regional things. 
but we were still responsible for those regional aspects. Uh -huh. uh, and yet we were not yet independent. So we were doing aspects of foreign exchange. The British basically were, were, were not too concerned. These little sections in there, particularly foreign affairs and defense, were to guard against the aspects of the Cold War, the communist capitalist West, the communist East and the capitalist West, the tensions that existed in the 1970s and in the 80s, we shall see, um, were, were, were some of the things that dictated this. Because they were concerned Cuba had risen up in the late 50s, early 60s. Here were all these little semi-independent states of the Associated States. And there was concern by the major powers, both the US and Britain, and France, because we were in between two French territories, um, about our ability to negotiate for things for ourselves. Mm -hmm. When independence came in 1978, foreign affairs was granted. And the first country to recognize Dominica to become uh, associated with us, with ambassador and all, was the Venezuela, the Republic of Venezuela. And that's where we started, the British, of course, our membership of the Commonwealth, our membership of the United Nations. But we shall see as we go ahead, and I, I will explain, mm -hmm. this, this adventure that we was, uh, were on and the way in which certain errors we made along the way. And why, you know, the astute nature of the leadership today has to be concerned about some of the things that we got ourselves in trouble with in the past. It's interesting that you would, you would, you would end up your, your initial presentation on that note, because I, I, I now want to ask Dr. Aaron to, to, to come back in. Um, and, and because you also made mention of, 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 of some of the things that happened in, happened in the 70s post-independence. Mm -hmm. And we would have, we would have had um, our first prime minister since then, and there would have been certain political moves and maneuvers which would have platformed some of the things that you that you mentioned mm -hmm. that you will elaborate, we'll elaborate as, as we go further. Dr. Aaron, um, in keeping with what Dr. Honichich just, just mentioned, um, what, what I wanted to explain to the viewers and listeners now is um, the type of political uh, uh, environment that existed and the political leadership right um, from independence through the 70s, uh, sort of connecting it with, with, with the, 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 these two very important points that Dr. Honeychurch made. Yeah, well, we've had seven prime ministers. Right. We have had seven prime ministers starting with Patrick John for a year, I'm talking independence, 1978, November 3rd. Uh, Patrick John for a year, there's a lot of instability in the first period. So seven prime ministers, Patrick John for a year, OJ Serafin for a year. Then we have some stability. Initially, um, during, that's Mary Eugenia Charles, for 15 years, three terms. But it would be important to, to, to probably uh, I'll break it down. View, uh, but just let yeah. the viewers and listeners understand why we had Patrick John for one year. Right. And, uh, right. What is it that brought about Patrick John one year, OJ Serafin one year? Right. So, so I, I'll deal with that. But, but, but you can see the contrast with that one year, one year, that's one year Patrick John, one year um, OJ Serafin, mm -hmm. but 15 years Mary Eugenia Charles. Uh, five years, um, um, Prime Minister James. You have another period again of one year, um, um, Prime Minister Douglas, uh, three years, Prime Minister Charles, and 11 years, Prime Minister Skerritt. The one year of um, Prime Minister John is as a result of a number of situations. The most concrete situation um, comes out from his own tendency uh, to use power Right, rough, hard power, as opposed to um, soft power, to deal with. Instead of persuasion, instead of speaking, calling out uh, the, the security forces to quell uh, um, um, a demonstration, a mass demonstration, mm -hmm. uh, about, about a quarter of the population of Dominica comes out on May 29, that everybody has as a reference May 29. But that is at, at the final point, May 29. But people will disagree as to what leads up to May 29. Uh, I have had disagreements with others. In a way, behind that personal tendency to use power is an economic view. You can consider that since Patrick John's May 29 issue has to do a lot with industrial relations, meaning trade unions, how to handle uh, strikes and non-strikes, 
as well as whether you can, the media can speak freely, but speak on what? You can ask the question, what was the major problem behind that decision? And to a large extent, it's an economic issue, all right? He is trying, Patrick John is trying to basically create a, a special region. Uh, Dr. Honeychurch just talked about the very same cab rates. Right. He's, he's, he's actually trying to do a sort of special development zone in the north of the country. And as a result of that, and he, associate, he associates himself with characters that are unsavory. Well, again, Dr. Um, Honeychurch referenced that. Uh, just, uh, just for the benefit of the viewer, I should mm -hmm. I know we have some slides. I'm hoping that um, uh, somewhere along the discussion yeah. we can get it in. So because, people, yeah, so so, actually, so, actually um, if the technicians could uh, you know, look for slide number nine with Patrick John, and then we could go through. Because the other element to bring in, I know a lot of times people are blaming Patrick John. Um, and yes, you know, the buck stops with the leader. But we must understand that at that time in Dominica, there was this Machiavellian attorney general called Leo Austin. Mm -hmm. And he was a great manipulator behind the scenes, both in relation to Leblanc and more so in relation to John. And he got John tied up with a lot of very controversial foreign affairs uh, relationships mm -hmm. that went right through to South Africa at the time that he was in apartheid. But we will yeah, I will talk about that. I want to do Dr. Honeychurch. I, yeah. I want Dr. Aaron to, to sort of put it in, in context and allow you right at the same time to, to, okay. to speak to the foreign policy aspect so we could take it at, at uh, look at the eras of the various prime ministers. And we will also interact. Right. So you, you dis I'm sure he will disagree with some things. <laughs> uh, I will say, I will disagree. That should be helpful. I will agree, absolutely. So, so you have this economic question. Uh, and Patrick John tries to create a special development area in the north, um, associating with various foreign, unsavory foreign characters. As a result, he, he starts a firestorm. He tries to suppress that political firestorm mm -hmm. using law, all right? Proposing two bills that further inflame people. And finally, on May 29, brings out the ultimate force firepower, um, you know, uh, and that causes, mainly it starts his fall. From May 29, he's a, a, he's a former, you know, protege of his, O.J. Seraphim, somebody whom he had liked, promoted, relieves him, becomes the compromise leader of a national unity government. Uh, which we call the interim government. Yeah. Uh, because the interim government is in between from then to the next election. Their major job was to prepare the next election, uh, led by Oliver Seraphin. Oliver Seraphin lasts for a year. Another circumstance comes and affects him very badly. While he is pulling the country back together from all the chaos of the May 29 and its aftermath, a lot of things happen, just keeping it simple for now. Hurricane David, one of those new climate change superstorms, hits on August 29, a few months uh, later, destroys, kills about 30 something people, destroys about 70% of the value of agriculture, 70% of the housing stock, and creates a major problem. He has to deal with also major foreign affairs issues because he's trying to raise funds and coordinate an immense amount of resources coming in. He does not succeed in doing that and keeping the confidence of the people. So the elections that he organizes in 1980, he loses to a very organized, a very mature Mary Eugenia Charles leading the Dominica Freedom Party. Important, I think, to add that she is the oldest person to reach prime minister, which is important for development, how personally developed, how developed as a leader you are when you take over, how much do you grow in office, and how much does that affect the stability 
of the country. So we go, we're going to come to, to the Eugene Charles event. Dr. Nature, what, what I'd like for you to do now, and of course, like Dr. Ernst said there, I'm expecting there to, to be some interaction and agreement. And we're we're getting to the 80s. Yes. When we get to yes. the 80s, yes. <laughs> then it's yes. 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 But what I want you to do is to, to now um, um, give the viewers and, listen, uh, and listeners an opportunity to understand, was there time for even uh, any kind of foreign policy yes. move? And, and if so, Yes. What was it between the Patrick John and OJ Seraphine in the political era? Hmm. Well, let us understand. Um, Patrick John inherited the position of Premier from Leblanc in 1974. In 1975, March the 24th, just last week, makes 40 years since that election. So 40 years have passed since Patrick John became um, the elected political leader um, of D Dominica. But the, then the following year, he went in to beginning the process of getting into independence. It has been all explained, the confusion of that time. And um, once again, immediately on independence, Lee Austin starts to utilize the advantage of foreign affairs to try to negotiate these peculiar deals. It's desperation. You know, you, you have a country, you have leaf spot, there was a great- What, what peculiar deals? Oh, well, what I mean to say is, the thing is, the economy was really on the rocks. Mm -hmm. um, the banana situation was very serious. There was a leaf spot. It, couldn't, it had been taking a lot of time to solve. And uh, basically, the political upheavals that have been pointed out were there. So those first few months, I mean, he wasn't even in prime minister for a year. It was only seven months. And uh, during that period of time, they tried to negotiate these peculiar deals like cutting off. I had a slide here. I don't know if the slides are working, mm -hmm. but if you can find a slide with um, Don Pearson, who was on the 6th of February, uh, 1979, 40 square miles of Dominica was handed over. You can understand that kind of foreign affairs relationship. There was this guy called um, Sidney Burnett Aline, who um, another 400 acres was taken from the Woodford Hill area, and he was able then to go and negotiate for things which were later found out to be associated with South Africa. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a, a real foreign relations mess because once the international media caught on to this, Dominica started off with this very bad name, you know, as a result of these negotiations, particularly done by, by Leo Austin. Seraphim, poor guy, there he is, <laughs> trying to fit the place together with all of this political confusion going through. He is sworn in in June of 1979. July, at the end of August, 29th August, this massive hurricane that has just been outlined there by Phil Baderon sweeps over Dominica. Massive destruction. OJ Seraphine is then thrown into the position of emergency foreign affairs. Mm -hmm. This is not a matter of being able to you know, sit down and plan who we will negotiate with. He had to go out on a begging mission. He had to um, make uh, uh, the international community as aware as possible. How, how, would you, how would you describe and define his foreign policy move, if, 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 if that was one? Because you just said well, that he had to go out begging here. So how do you define it? Why I define it? it simply as emergency foreign relations. <laughs> it was an emergency. Nothing, nothing necessarily structured and, and, and steeped in here. Wherever, wherever, you had, um, well, of course, the Venezuelans were among the first to come. The British arrived the day after. Um, and of course, our longstanding relations with Britain has been very good. The Americans, the French army took over various playing fields and put up their camps and all that. You had that to deal with, but you were also trying to get funds. I mean, the, the Cubans, we, we, we have to get into the Cuba situation because oh, good friend. that started off way back before we had official foreign relations and command of our foreign affairs. Roosevelt Douglas was playing his own foreign affairs role, <laughs> you, you know, without a state. But I recall that, that is very interesting. In the 70s. I'd like to, if you if you allow, yeah, sure. to go back yeah. to uh, um, the Patrick John era and uh, the interpretation of the source of Patrick John's problems. Um, no, that I think is important because I believe one of the goals for us here tonight, especially particularly for me, I can speak for myself, is to arrive at knowledge 
and especially how to, technical knowledge, in the sense that we do geothermal, we do other things. We do best practices for almost everything now. What is the best way to do this? Mm -hmm. The prime minister's position, the prime minister position, the most influential position in our system, there are things that we have learned about it, and there should be a body of knowledge to guide us. And as we go along mm -hmm. in our development, political development, we should grow it and refine it. And one of the things is, is Patrick John is two things have been blamed for Patrick John's troubles. One thing on one person, economic hard time. I would like to counter that. And two, the Machiavellian, like you say, Attorney General. Start with the Attorney General. In which book should an Attorney General, especially the way the Attorney General is constructed in the Constitution of Dominica, in which book really should an Attorney General have a leader like a puppet? Which will also ask you, what kind of man, what kind of prime minister who is elected by the people, mm -hmm. who runs a party, allows himself to be manipulated, controlled, like history has put it, by his attorney general. If you will recall the attorney general positions in the last few years, they have been Francine Barron, Levi Peter. We can go further back. We can go further back to attorney generals. That is one. I do not think I would propose that Patrick John's troubles should not be blamed so strongly on his attorney general. It would, it would upturn the, 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 the distribution of power in our system. As a second thing is the economic one. I just look, look yeah, I just say the man was a <laughs> Austin like, was a master manipulator. He was even before Patrick John became chosen as the leader of the Labour Party. LeBlanc had Ronald Armour as deputy <laughs> premier, and the plan was that when the delegates came to the um, Goodwill uh, um, High School, school yeah. um, and 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 voted that Ronald Armour would be the premier of the Dominican Republic. Church, are you, I, I, is, I, is a response seeking to say that, 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 that um, Patrick John should not be held responsible for no, no, no. some of the things that no, happened? No, no, no. You, as I said, you are the leader, the buck stops here. Right. But when you have this powerful individual, you know, highly manipulative, mm -hmm. and he wants you to be prime minister rather than perhaps someone with a greater gravitas mm -hmm. and knowledge of the law. And it's, 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 easier to, it's, it's, it's easier to manipulate. He would not want a trained lawyer like Ronald Armour there. Mm -hmm. He knew he wouldn't be able to manipulate Ronald Armour. But, but there's a question I want to ask before we jump in, though. So what, 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 about, what, what is it that, that had Patrick John's uh, attention that, he, that didn't allow him to see that about Leo Austin? Because, or is it that Patrick John was just clearly weak? But he couldn't have been weak, I think. I don't think he, he, I mean, he couldn't have been weak. The guy succeeds. He succeeds at ousting, like, you know, Dr. Honeychurch mentioned, out, out maneuvering. Out maneuvering. When an Ilo Libra begins to fade from the scene, because before Ilo Libra resigns in the middle of 74, he is already very absent from the political scene, from at least governance. And already Patrick John becomes deputy and minister for finance. Mm -hmm. He outmaneuvers on the, left, on the transfer of, the, um, of power in the party. He, ha he succeeds in outmaneuvering um, guys who are more educated than him. Mm -hmm. That is 74. But he takes the party to the elections and he beats the Freedom Party winning 16 seats. That is not a weak guy. No, I have a question. Yeah. But and so mean, how does but a 16, how does a guy who has that power allow himself to be so manipulated 
by a guy who he gives a job, a guy who is a public officer, attorney mm -hmm. general. I, I suspect not, not attorney general, because what I, I, I want, I want, and then, and then I will ask, I ask a, a question. I want to explain two things about that landslide 40 years ago <laughs> in 1975. <laughs> two things. One is a master, another master planner, Dennis Joseph. <laughs> Dennis Joseph was in charge of that campaign, right? It was a very clever campaign. You created this atmosphere of fear, dreads. You know, the country is going uh, to be uh, uh, taken over by these wild people in the forest. And that's why we have, in 1974, November, to establish this defense force. And a few white people are murdered in the hills. And um, this is creating catastrophe and fear. Who is going to solve this catastrophe? Ha, huh, the sheriff the knight in shining armor, Patrick John. I am going to solve the problem for all of you all, and we will have peace and prosperity. And that's the campaign of 1975, and everybody in fear and trepidation and hope for a better, they go and vote 16 seats. But there, is, I, I, but there is a problem. Traditionally, the kingmaker disappears significantly like, like um, um, Dennis did mm -hmm. uh, in a certain way um, after the guy wins his, 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 his office. I mean, it's not something we would resolve, but it, I, it seems to me that the source of, of, of Patrick John's problems is in his personality, in his character. The evidence shows that during his t period, the growth of the economy was among the highest. So although there were trouble spots in the economy, there were catastrophes like in bananas and so forth, the growth rate of the 70s are the highest growth rate. So it is, you know, I mean, it's, so there, there, there's a problem there with the, with the economic thing. I am submitting that the leadership the, I mean, the, the prime minister's position is a concentration of power, a lot of power, and the individual who holds that position must be politically and otherwise mature that he can actually conduct himself in a particular way and lead the country in a particular way. No, Patrick I, John had those issues. Now, we spend a lot of time on the, on the Patrick yeah. John um, 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 Ojo Seraphim um, era. The, quest, the final question on that before we um, um, take off our first quick break to come back is, and, and of course it's open to, to mm -hmm. both gentlemen. Clearly, there, there, there was some confusion. There, there's some confusion. Yeah. But Dr. Honichuch, could it be that it is as a result of that type of confusion that there was no clearly mapped out um, um, foreign policy and so it was grappling at anything, coupled with the, the, the Hurricane David and, 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 and so on. So could it be, because of that yes. um, jostling here, there, and everywhere, that there was no time, or very little time, for, say, specialized, well thought of foreign policy mode? You can say that, because you had the first seven months of Patrick John, a lot of confusion, very difficult to set up, you know, except for those people who were going to sign up as um, recognizing Dominica. Then you had the Oliver Seraphin period, of the interim government when things were equally confused, particularly after Hurricane David. So the person who arrives on the scene in 1980, Eugenia Charles, not yet Dame, Eugenia Charles arrives and wins that election of 1980. And it is then that a kind of concerted, organized foreign affairs for an independent Dominica begins. It's on that note we're going to take off first break. When we come back, we will, we will, we will take off from there for the, the, the next aspect of our discussion. This is the, the 1980 era, right. poli po uh, political and foreign right. affairs. We're going to take our first break. When we come back, we'll continue our discussion. Stay right here with us. Did you know the Caribbean Court of Justice's role is to make sure that your rights under the CARICOM Single Market and Economy, CSME, are the same in whichever CARICOM country you go to? The revised Treaty of Chagaramas is the legal instrument that created the CSME. It was signed in 2001 by the CARICOM governments. The CCJ is the only court in the world that is allowed to interpret the treaty. 
This means that it clarifies it for all CARICOM countries and all CARICOM people. All of these things will ensure that our families, businesses, money and assets are handled the same anywhere in CARICOM without discrimination. That is what is called the CCJ's original jurisdiction. Listen closely and you will hear what climate change might sound like. Hurricanes getting stronger and more frequent. Glaciers melting, causing a rise in sea levels. Dry bush burning after a prolonged drought left the bushes vulnerable to fires. What? No water again? But listen closely again, and you will hear the solutions. People switching to energy-saving light bulbs. People building stronger homes that can withstand hurricane force winds. Our climate may be changing, but so can we. Making small changes together can have a huge effect on reducing the impacts of climate change. Act now. Rally. Rethink. Respond. This message is brought to you by the OECS Secretariat with funded assistance from USAID. In studio discussions, insight, Creole News, Road to the Throne, Calypso, Creole Festival, Carnival, and lots more local programming. See it all on the Government Information Service, your first for local news. Welcome back and thank you so much for staying with us. Of course, tonight we're having a very special discussion. Dominica since independence, politics and foreign affairs, two esteemed gentlemen right here, Dr. Aaron and Dr. Honichich. So prior to the break, um, very healthy, very educational discussion on the Patrick John Oja Serafin era, politically and um, uh, foreign affairs. And we were almost grappling to find out what was the foreign affairs because you found very little. But in a nutshell, there was some it was a scatter, it was, it, it was, it was that's right, emergency foreign affairs. So we got to, 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 to 1980, Dr. Aaron, and um, the Dame Eugenia Charles won the election. Uh, I'm sure between yourself and Dr. Honichich, you would have chronicled a number of political moves um, that uh, Dame Eugenia Charles would have embarked upon. We, 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 want to, we want to identify a few of them and put it into, in, in, into context as it relates to how it platformed what Dr. Honeychurch referred to as a somewhat more concerted and concentrated effort on foreign, on, on, on foreign policy. Well, Mary Eugenia Charles comes to office, wins the election with um, 17 seats of her own, as the Dominican Freedom Party wins 17 seats. And there are two independent seats that caucus with the Dominican Freedom Party. Was it during that year Dr. Honichuk was part of the parliament? Was it during that Yeah, he was, yeah he, he was a framer. He, he, doesn't like to, <laughs> he doesn't like to say it himself. I was, a, I was <laughs> nominated by Eugenia Charles in 1975. <laughs> so that 40 years ago, at the age of 22, <laughs> I became a my own third nominated member. Okay, we'll come to you now. But he doesn't like to say he's a framer of the constitution. Um, so Mary Eugenia Charles has 19 seats to control. And there are two opposition seats, and that is uh, Portsmouth and the Saladier. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the, 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 these two holdout seats, the, 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 the freedomites of the time are so angry that they call Portsmouth the black carriage, and they call um, Saladier the red carriage. And mm -hmm. so these, these are the only That's two. That's the first time I'm hearing that. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 I'm from Portsmouth. Okay. okay. And, and at the time. So there's. For the first five years, Mary Eugenia Charles actually, because of that, two um, independent seats and two um, labor, democratic labor seats, because of that stalemate, for the first five years, Mary Eugenia Charles runs the country without an opposition leader. Without an opposition leader. And maybe we should add that because of those two, two, everybody knew that the other two were actually freedomites, but they were running as independents. <laughs> <laughs> the 2-2, two -two, therefore it was argued that a president should appoint the four opposition senators in his own deliberate judgment. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, that means to say Michael Douglas, um, as a leader of that two faction, was not permitted to nominate mm -hmm. his own. And so you had representatives of you know, <laughs> women's group and unions and whatever. Mm -hmm. So yes. So the effect is, the effect is <coughs> that Mary Virginia Charles comes to office in 1980, has the control of 19 seats. The country has just come from labor chaos under um, PJ and OJ. And she establishes a, f a firm hand on the government. She has two major tasks. She inherits some of the, the Hurricane David um, chaos that OJ Serafin uh, could not have handled. Was, I mean, it was a lot. She inherits some of that to fix, as well as to pull the country, to unite the country after the May 29th chaos that Patrick John left. Uh, but she has, she has a lot of challenges, but she has great resources. 1980 is one of the highest growth rates the year, the year 1980, sees the highest um, spikes in economic activities for Dominica. There's a lot of foreign aid um, pouring in and so forth. She has other challenges, but Mary Virginia Charles basically begins to turn the direction of Dominica, both in international relations, foreign policy, because this is the Cold War. There, there are two camps in the world, um, major camps. There, uh, there is the West, with, led by the United States, and there is the East, led by Russia. And we are firmly in the camp of the West, with America. And in the Caribbean, uh, like Dr. Henry Church will, 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 will discuss, it means that Cuba, which was aligned to what used to be called the Warsaw Pact and, you know, and the, the Eastern Bloc, Dominica actually helps to contain and isolate Cuba during, during that period. And during that time, during that time, uh, not only is uh, our, our forces, the um, labor forces, but also progressive forces, two views of the world. We have what we used to call, without any shame, a capitalist economy, people for that, and those for, without any shame, a socialist economy. The, there's a huge battle. The unions are very important. There is the legacy of that, acti that time for today. It is in Patrick John's time, OJ, and the beginning of Mary Virginia Charles' time, labor unions, which are an important tool for equalizing opportunity the world over. Europe, for example, has some of the, the most equal societies income and wealth most equally distributed. And one of the major causes is because of a history of labor unions. Well, those labor unions, by 1980 and further on, begin to lose their influence for a number of reasons. And what we overall have is for the 15 years mostly, you have a period of conservative government rule in which Mary Eugenia Charles tries to established established an economy, especially around the private sector, with minimal um, labor union interference. And that is a philosophy domestically. That is how she tries to grow the economy and spread wealth, as well as that is how she does it in foreign affairs. Firmly aligned with Taiwan, firmly aligned with the, uh, the, the, the other countries of the West. And what is also critical, I'm sure Dr. Honichich will discuss, is that whereas in 78 and 79, there are only nine relationships established between Patrick John and Oliver Serafin, Mary Eugenia Charles alone establishes 22, mm -hmm. about 22. Foreign relations. Foreign relations. Yeah. And so, is a major, she's foreign affairs for the first, um, minister for the first 10 years. So she really shapes to a very large extent what a foreign minister is and what Dominica's foreign policy establishment, mm -hmm. that is the ministry, um, ambassadors, and so forth, um, uh, what those things mean. Now, so, before Dr. Hintich comes in, I, I want to ask you another question that would probably, you know, even, even, even provide 
a, a wider scope for the discussion. If, if you were to, say, identify within each of the five-year terms of Mary Junior Charles and her administration, um, one or two major political moves, Dr. Aaron, um, which uh, would have left its, its, its mark on the country still today, what would, what, what, would, what would they be, if any? I mean, you know, they don't necessarily have to look to point to all of them, but, but, but one or two of them within each of the five-year terms. So, well, the, the, first, the first term of Mary Virginia Charles is the most, in my view, most definitive term. That is the term where not only does she wield uh, a lot of power, in addition to the office of prime minister, which is the most powerful in the political system, she also has a lot of moral influence besides her office on not only unions, but the private sector, the church, uh, the, the civil society. She has a lot of that in the first term. There are a lot of uh, physical projects that go on too. There's a rebuilding of roads, um, lighting up the country again because the, um, the cables were down, you know, telephones and are problematic. The East Coast had no electricity ever. Mm -hmm. And she brought in the uh, extension of the electrics mm -hmm. to the east. And other basic utilities, water. Um, she, she, she does, she brings, she's, you know, mm -hmm. the Central Water Authority, the, um, the, the water uh, company uh, had been uh, very conservative um, before that. She expands that for, for, uh, so for the first time, places like, like Penville and others uh, um, get pipe born water. Her second term, is you know, from 85 to 90 is less less marked by the Freedom Party and and herself in my view. By that time, there is you know, um, opposition is building, and there is disappointment is beginning to creep in um, over the amount of changes, especially economic changes that she is able to do, and it is reflected in declining support in politics. That is the opposite of what we will see later, where Roosevelt Skerritt changes the trajectory. Normally, you lose seats as you go on, generally. And Mary Eugenia Charles does that. She loses seats uh, in, the, as in, in the 1985 elections. And the 1990 to 1995 elections, and period, term, which you're asking about, mm -hmm. is absolutely a dud. It's really not fantastic. And that is the period in which the world is changing very rapidly around Mary Eugenia Charles, uh, in part because of her own actions. So for example, she, one of her high points is that she invites uh, the United States to invade Grenada. Uh, invade Grenada. That's the end of the first term. Just like um, Dr. Honeychurch was referring to, referring to the Patrick John victory in 1975, um, spread up by fear, the, her, her, she's at, the, at her heights, known worldwide, especially for challenging the media and defending the President of the United States. She wins the 1985 elections. She is morally high, but she starts going down. By 1990, the world is changing. There is the, the, the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc is breaking down. That's right. And the important thing, two things that are important there are, are the following. One, the capitalist, socialist, economy type questions become blurred, right? People don't see such a contrast. The other thing is, as the Soviet Union is breaking down and communism is receding, a major tool of the Freedom Party in getting support, making people afraid, like Patrick John had people afraid of dreads and so forth. Mary Eugenia Charles' Dominican Freedom Party's trump card was f a fear of communism. Mm -hmm. My good friend, um, Dr. B. Rivier, uh, will remember that very, 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 very well. Uh, so, but that is breaking down. And people are now less afraid of the communist bogey. They are less afraid of you know, all those fancy tales. We don't have you know, time to talk yeah. about the amount mm -hmm. of fancy tales that are being told about communism. And the opposition, in that case, you know, Labour Party opposition, is beginning to rally back its troops. That is when the United Workers Party senses a chance, forms, and 
you know, hastens mm -hmm. the end of Mary Virginia Charles's um, government. Not she, she doesn't lose. Yeah. She, 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 she retires from politics. Yeah. Um, there's a story that um, the, the United Workers Party drew her from office. That is not true. Mm -hmm. She retires after 15 years. But things are, it's a different world by 90 to 95. Check with Dr. Enrich comes in. Uh, it's, it's interesting Dr. Enrich mentioned um, Paul Revere. Because I remember, and Doctor, you would know that you know Crater, my yeah, good friend Portsmouth. Yeah. So we don't leave PS as we go by Crater to wait for the vehicles and and, and guys that when they see Power coming, Power would say, um, <laughs> they, they would tell, make us believe that Power would cause coming to tell us if if our father had two goods, mm -hmm. one would be for us and one would be for all the government there because at that time uh, you would need to believe that. Um, the, the socialist aspect of politics was what you didn't want to get close to. I remember the days when uh, fellows would even fear Rose, when Rose would say things up, uh, and Poza and Zafar Mouni, Ivoyo, Aibuna, Cuba. Right. <laughs> Dr. Elitrich, uh, so 80 yeah, so to, 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 um, 80 to 95. That's right. Um, the, the, you said right at the top of your presentation that there was greater effort in terms of a little more focus place on foreign policy. Well, we what, what, what was some of that? Yeah, well, we must understand. The, the period earlier was so confused, it was difficult to establish this. And um, once Eugenia Charles took over, there was this rebuilding to take place. I mean, it's all been outlined already by, by Dr. Aaron. But the thing is that uh, because of this restructuring and rebuilding, you needed foreign aid and assistance. Right. And so you also needed, there was another thing, to give Dominica a good name again, because Dominica's name has been ravaged. Right. All the international media, panorama programs on the BBC, you know, they had really taken hold of the Leo Austin, Patrick John chaos mm -hmm. that had happened, and it was all over the, the, the media, you know. So therefore, she had to use that first term, both to get materials to rebuild the country, create stability within the country, and also repair Dominica's name for the first time since independence um, within the world, main world. We also have to note the establishment of the OECS, which was also in the early 80s. And that was a very important component. Eugenia Charles was there. Morris Bishop was still alive. He participated uh, at the meeting that formed it back in, um, in St. Kitts, in, in, in Bastyr and St. Kitts. Uh, so all of this was going on, and then, as has been pointed out, you had the Grenada invasion. The fact that she happened at that time to be chair of the OECS, and the leader of the OECS therefore had to take this action, because you could not there, uh, we have her on the screen, um, on the morning of the 25th of October 1983, she is persuading um, the cabinet the U.S. cabinet with Reagan over there uh, to, as to what has happened and why it is important that they take part. Now, internationally, she was really smashed by the more leftist governments for her role. And so immediately, the next day, she had to go and be in the United Nations, as we see here, um, basically arguing and explaining why it was you could not go and change governments in the Eastern Caribbean by lining them up against the wall and shooting them dead. That was what happened in Grenada. Um, and you know, people have doctored it up in many ways, but quite bluntly, that is what she and Tom Adams and Compton and Mitchell and all the others teamed together were fighting. But I do agree in terms of what Dr. Iran has said, that she chose a path. She chose a foreign affairs path. The Cold War was on, it's all been explained, and she felt that this was the beneficial route to go. Because foreign affairs, when you take it to the basics, foreign affairs is basically charting associations with countries that you perceive are going to be for benefit of your people. Dr. Dr. did we, so can we say during this, 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 this um, Mary Day, Mary Jane Richards era, the, the, the term an aligned and non-aligned movement was very vivid because our foreign, what also level, was our foreign policy very much aligned to... Yeah, well, nowadays you don't hear about non-aligned. Non-aligned, that's the point. So, but so was it was it very much um, um, aligned to, to the West? Certainly in the 70s, you know, the aligned was that you aligned with the West 
and non-aligned countries, essentially, that you were not going to put yourself with the left or the right. But you said the 70s, didn't that still exist in the 80s? Like it, li it lingered on into, into the 1980s, definitely. And the advantage that Eugenia Charles sought to exploit was the fact that after Grenada, you had, well, from the early 80s, you had Ronald Reagan in the White House, you had Margaret Thatcher in London, and um, a number of other, the Prime Minister of um, and, um, Australia was a great supporter of hers. Mm -hmm. Lee Van Q, that has just died in Singapore, yeah. defended her in her action in Grenada and that kind of stuff. I think we have a slide there of Margaret Thatcher, Indira Gandhi, and Eugenia Charles to show, you know, a prominence mm -hmm. in, in foreign but was, affairs. But the, well, but J.D. Oates, she could have, if she was another kind of leader, let's say she was a Morris Bishop, she would have chosen another route, you know, Bulgaria and the um, well, Warsaw yeah. Bloc and so She decided that she's choosing this route because of the investment that she hoped they would get. She was severely let down. She made a speech in 1993, the Independence Address of 1993. If you read that Independence Address, she basically mourns the fact that these people that supported her in the 1980s have now turned their back. Turn their backs. Mm -hmm. And the money that would have was coming in uh, is no longer. 1988 was the plateau for Dominica. Mm -hmm. the, the, the money that was coming in from bananas, the investment, and then that plateau of 1988 then declined. And by 1993, as I said, she was also in a local political state because she only won 11 seats yes. in 1990. Mm -hmm. And she made that famous statement at Point Michel. See, you, must for, you must forgive me if my I eyes only fall on, on the 11, 11 constituencies voted for me. that voted and for she me. Like, and she, like Edison James, wept that night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but generally, our friends, our friends, yeah. our friends have, um, have confided that um, she wept that night for receiving 11 And, and then there's the, other, there's the other issue of finding a leader, because she had made it quite clear in her independence address in 1988. Mm -hmm. She said, I was going to end in 1990, but I have prayed, I have talked to people, and I am going to continue for one more term. And the whole of Windsor Park erupted in applause and whatever, but maybe she should have gone a little earlier. But we don't know. That's how it's But the difficulty of finding a new leader, mm -hmm. that was a question. Especially if you didn't cultivate one. Well, you cannot find a leader. If you occupy a seat for 10 years, and that's one of the major challenges with uh, Dominica's, Dominica's leadership, meaning the way leadership is practiced in Dominica. You see it in businesses. You see it in, in um, service organizations you see it in, in politics. And that was one of uh, the challenges that Mary Eugenia Charles had there. How do you find a leader if you didn't prep one? You've been chauffeur in the seat. Is, is it that you're expecting them to, to emerge? Uh, well, first of all, they do not emerge like flowers. <laughs> you, have to them. you have to nurture them. Right. And if you occupy the most powerful position, the most powerful seat, and uh, not just prime minister position, you have also, you run you, the party also. Mm -hmm. And you cannot find, when you come to, to, to um, give up, you cannot find somebody to give in to. You didn't place anybody there, you will not find any. But we, 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 it's amazing how quickly the time flies by. So I, I, I really want us to exhaust the, 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 the time speaking, at least giving adequate um, attention to all the, the prime minister years. Okay. So therefore, gentlemen, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Mitchell, you referred to the Patrick John, PJOJ mm -hmm. foreign policy term as emergency mm -hmm. foreign policy. If you were to coin the 80 to 95 era, what, what, how would you coin that? What, 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 if a, a young person viewing and listening to this program tonight um, wanted to say, um, wanted to put a card on, on what, what, what was, how would you best define the foreign policy of, of, of that period? What would that be? Well, a, a foreign policy, a stabilizing foreign policy that um, was going to establish the offices required, all of the um, uh, things that you require in foreign affairs, both within places like North America and Europe and England. Um, and so therefore, like for instance, she chose her good friend Frank Barron 
to represent both the Court of St. James in England and also the UN and Washington DC as non-resident ambassador and stuff like that. Um, and the associations she made personally with leaders. She had this personal contact with Margaret Thatcher. Uh, it's interesting that we would make that statement because I'm, I'm that I, I want you to come back to that mm. as we come closer to the current prime minister, yeah. this personal relationship thing, because that I think has been banded around and, and received some criticisms. Mm. I think because of the lack of understanding. So it's very, very instructive that you would even make mention of that at this point in the discussion. So I, I, I'm sure we're going to come back to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because of her strength of character, there are people admired her. I mean, when we read the, the collections in the press internationally, you know, there was this little island in the Caribbean that had this prime minister that would, would impress them at international conferences and so But that last period, she was getting tired, and it is generally believed now that the dementia that she finally kind of affected her health was beginning to take root. And, and uh, however, as has already been mentioned, it cannot say that she was defeated because she said two years before, you know, I am retired. Mm -hmm. I am I'm retiring. The problem was to find a successor. But um, I don't want us to dominate this time without and lose that last period, which is very interesting. It's when the UWP take over for four and a half years, and then that. That, 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 is, that is where we're at. That's, yeah. that's where we're at. That's the yeah. point we're at. Yeah. And so um, the United Workers Party wins the election in 1995. Dr. Aaron. Well, yeah, the United Workers Party uh, organizes 1988. There are, there, there are interesting things going on. The main thing at the time is that the Freedom Party is going down. Oh, the Freedom Party is going down. The, the, the reason, one of the two reasons, major reasons, one internal, one external, that the Freedom Party is going down, because that shapes what comes up after, is that personally, Mary Eugenia Charles is fading. Mm -hmm. She was a lawyer. That was, uh, for a prime minister, that was a really an upgrade in technical training. All right, because O.J. Serafin, Patrick John, their academic backgrounds were not as strong. They are not usually cited, except to make fun of um, Patrick John, who got himself, by some means, right, never leaving Rosso, and before the internet age, having a doctorate in metaphysics, which Dennis Joseph used to tout a lot on the radio <laughs> with you know, a fanfare, all the titles before Patrick John made one of his many speeches. So it was a laughing matter. So Mary Eugenia Charles, 15 years lawyer, did some great work for Dominica, irrespective of her political uh, ideological slant. But she's going down. And the world is changing. Dr. Hennessey referred to her disappointment by the time uh, 92, 95. It's a new world. And what happens is the Labour Party is reorganizing, also trying to really grasp the new world. Because it's no longer a world with sharp contrast between capitalists and communists, and Eastern Bloc and Western Bloc, Russia and America. So that is an intellectual problem for the Labour Party, too. And between those two things, Labour Party, Freedom Party, neither quite one on the decline, one on, you know, not quite ready, a technical group, I say technical group because the United Workers Party organizes, and it's, at the time, its major appeal is that it's a technocratic party, whereas the Labour Party was founded on ideological premises of labor, work, meaning working the people, and, yeah, and, you know, and so, and, and, you know, as you mentioned, Monsignor Labouwe, that kind of background. The Freedom Party was equally ideological, but from a different angle. The name Freedom Party suggests it was about a certain ideal, especially the early part of the Constitution, the guarantees on, on fundamental human rights and so forth two equally ideological parties from different sides of the spectrum. Well, the United Workers Party comes in as a technocratic party with a leader with a master's degree in a, in a science. And it appeals to 
business, the business class, especially the new business class, because the old business class had been with the Freedom Party and the Syrian Lebanese business class had been with the Labour Party. So it draws on those technicians, it draws on those business uh, um, and people, and I always say it's not just big businesses. Everybody with Rashad El Moui who considered himself a businessman joined that party and they go to an 11, a one-seat majority, 11 to 10 a majority in 95 and takes office. But those five years, of five years, 95 to 2000, those years of Edison James are really years without color and character. The economy is sputters between 95 and 2000. The average um, growth rate is um, about 1%. 1, 1 Bananas declined dramatically. And Edison James was a banana man. Even in the face of a promise of a dollar a pound. Well, that was propaganda promise. <laughs> that, was, that was clearly propaganda promise because the, the mechanics of the banana prices are such that people sold bananas, then received a price for the banana, for the banana that was already sold. But the mechanics of the pricing of banana and marketing of banana was that you couldn't control the price except if you, um, you, you in artificially um, you know, set the price here. You gave, in other words, not a price, but you gave money to farmers. The economy doesn't do well. And the personal manner of Edison James also is a problem. And that proves that it helps to make the case, uh, at least, that your experience in politics and in things human have a bearing on how well you manage political office. So Mary Eugenia Charles, a long um, involvement in her party, a long training in politics before becoming prime minister, does a certain kind of job. But the United Workers Party is the first party, Edison James is the first leader incumbent who offers himself to the people for re-election and the people say no way six months before the expiration of his five exactly. term. So, so pj is thrown out when he runs the, for, for election he's out of office in 1980. oj loses his seat oj loses oj loses his seat but he had never won the election Right? Mm -hmm. But Edison James is the first guy who wins a majority in the first election, stays in government for the full five years, no accident, and offers himself, and the people see him physically healthy and say no. That is different, for example, later too, when the guy who funds the, the coalition, Rosie Douglas, is not there by the time new elections come, and you have three leaders. So Edison James has that distinction. It's because there was not a strong character, when I say character, the coloring of the, of the government is, wasn't strong. The economic performance of the country wasn't strong. Mm -hmm. His personal touch was not uh, a very, what, is, what Caribbean people like. He was not a warm, outgoing, or accessible person. And the law we mentioned that generally, with time, your, your support, in government diminishes. He already had 11, so he had no way to go. Mm -hmm. And you see, it, it also circumstances beyond his control were having a serious effect. The price of bananas was going down, not, not necessarily because of some internal matter, mm -hmm. but because of the World Trade Organization decisions and the whole contest for banana primacy that was going on in the international. That was declining. Then also this desperation because they had accused Eugenia Charles of being too tight with the money, too tight with the economy. The argument was you must free up the money. Well, they freed up the money to a point where the debt was such no, that they, no had more money to be freed up. They, they had to go to commercial banks to borrow money for the airport scheme, um, which was one of the key platforms for the election. Mm -hmm. And all of this then, created an economic crisis where they even had to go and sell Domlek for 21 million, That's you right. know, which Eugene, of social security Eugenia, Eugenia Charles had built it up, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to be Domlek as a national uh, firm that was going to produce this electricity. 
So all these things were happening as well as there was this storm on the horizon. That is why I believe that it was decided to call the election six months earlier. Because that economic storm of that eventually broke in 2002. Do you think they, they necessarily set up Dr. Honey Church and, 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 and call I think internally, the, the state of it realized they took a gamble. Mm -hmm. They knew it was going to get worse. But before it get worse, if people's impressions were still that, you know, things were hunky-dory and sweet. So if we call an election at the end of January 2000, um, <clears throat> it is safer for us than to go and call a, an election in June. Is that and, and, the, and the gamble, the gamble didn't work. And so the, 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 the whole idea of breaking grounds everywhere was to sort of well, hype that kind yes, of thing? Yes, and borrow money to build roads in um, Petit Savan and, and over uh, no. Penville. But we also have to check that meanwhile all of this is going on, 1992, Michael Douglas dies. It frees up the space for Rosie Douglas to really, you know, open up and uh, his popularity, his charisma, and everything. Now, Dr. Mitchell, before we get to the, to the, 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 the coalition and, mm -hmm. and Rosie Douglas, I want to ask you, Dr. Owen quite um, nicely explained what was happening politically mm -hmm. and said that the, the political era was without character. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if he allowed me to add political character, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Was foreign policy on the front burner then? Well, if, if so, what was it? There was an attempt, and I would like if they could find the slide, slide number 26, because what happens during the UWP era is a lesson for any future leader dealing in foreign affairs. And that is their agreement when the British government requested that Mohammed al Masari come to Dominica, that Dominica take this individual that the British government did not want, but that no country was going to be willing to take because, you see, of his links, his antagonism against Saudi Arabia. And we did not know the name of Obama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden. <laughs> Sorry for the mistake. Sorry for the tongue. Osama. Um, we did not know yet, but he was very active in it. If we can have the next slide, we'll see that um, he uh, had established communication line for uh, mm -hmm. Osama bin Laden in the mid-1990s. The attempt is a result of pressure from the government of Saudi Arabia to which al Masari is opposed. So we were going to take this character mm -hmm. and bring him to Dominica. I don't understand mm -hmm. what the British had promised them to persuade them mm -hmm. to take on this. What the British had promised the United States Party government. Mm -hmm. Yes. But in the end, he did not come on a number of bases. One is, when the news hit the international media, I think the government got cold feet and they withdrew. But also, um, al Asari himself was concerned and his people about the security he would have. Because remember, he's a wanted man by a whole set of very powerful Arab states. And then the other um, situation is that we had not signed, we, although we had agreed, we had not fully signed the Un United Nations um, regulations rela related to refugees. Mm -hmm. So as a refugee here, he would not have that international protection. And so the whole thing collapsed. But it is an example, because what happened is, a few years later, by 2001, when the World Trade Towers start to burn, the names of the people that this man is associated with blast into the world. And we would have been tied up in there. Dominica would have been held um, responsible for protecting uh, this, this very dangerous individual. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are lessons. You know, as you go along on an independence journey, mm -hmm. you learn lessons. Do you see this particular situation that you've just outlined as characterizing the foreign policy um, attempt of the United States Party during that period? Well, it, it's part of a, a desperation. You, you have accused the Freedom Party of being too tight to the economy, nothing's happening, da, da, da. And you come in there and you need to show things because you have said that nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. And in desperation to show things, you try to negotiate with people to get you know, things. The whole, we haven't even yet dealt with the economic citizen program that Eugenia Charles started and that the way it was re-engineered 
you know, during the UWP period and then carried on to what it is today. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, there, are two other, there are two other, two other lessons associated to what you're saying about uh, um, the United Workers Party foreign policy. One of them is you have to be careful what you do in opposition. You can so oppose and criticize the government in place that you back yourself up against a wall. And the, the, the choices you have are so few that you get into trouble. So Edison James criticizes the management of bananas and promises a certain price. Mm -hmm. He criticizes the especially fiscal policy spending by Mary Virginia Charles, puts himself in too much spending and debt, and criticizes the foreign policy and also gets himself um, into trouble. So what you do in opposition, you have to be very careful that while you're preparing to take over the government, that the things that you say do not tie you, totally tie you up. And, and that is one of the things. But also the banana question, the banana issue, is something we have to look at very closely. I, I, I kindly disagree with um, Dr. Honeychurch when he refers to the banana situation of Edison James as beyond his control. One of the things you can manage, whereas you, I, I, I agree that you cannot, you couldn't control the price and so forth of bananas. And the World Trade Organization rulings. Mm -hmm. That is true. But what you could have controlled were expectations about it. And one of the ways of dealing with expectations is telling, is to complain and tell people exactly what it is. And if one person, so that's one thing, so that Edison James could have been more realistic in making promises about the price of bananas. But the second thing, the United Workers Party was premised on technical expertise. And Edison James' leadership was built on management of bananas. And they had a catchphrase that UWP had brought, Edison James had brought bananas from crisis, lift spot crisis on the, to recovery, to recovery. lift spot on the Patrick John OG to high prices recovery, and they would do the same thing for the country. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that the man who managed bananas and promised crisis to recovery, when it came to managing bananas from the most powerful position as prime minister, didn't do it. And a part of the reason is what he could control, expectations. He did not. So promising people those high prices. And those things, but let me just give you also a little statistic. Yeah, quickly, and we, we want to quickly get to Under Edison James, five years, the number of relationships, diplomatic relationships set up, five. In five years? In five years, Four five. Okay, Four. in 1979 and 80, nine are set up, two years. And in Mary Virginia Charles, 22 for 15 years. Five set up under the United Workers Party. Pierre Charles will do later on in three years, will do seven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so gentlemen, we're going to take our final break. Um, the plan was also to open up the lines, but I want us to deal with the 2000 to current mm -hmm. era, and then we'll open up the lines the last 15, 10 minutes so we can probably interact with the public. So we're going to take our final break. Um, before, well, the final break before we, we, we go to the phone calls. And we will come back and we will look at the 2000 to um, this current time, uh, political and foreign affairs era. Dominica since independence, politics and foreign affairs. We're coming right back. Listen closely and you will hear what climate change might sound like. Hurricanes getting stronger and more frequent. Glaciers melting, causing a rise in sea levels. Dry bush burning after a prolonged drought left the bushes vulnerable to fires. What? No water again? But listen closely again, and you will hear the solutions. People switching to energy-saving light bulbs. People building stronger homes that can withstand hurricane force winds. Our climate may be changing, but so can we. Making small changes together can have a huge effect on reducing the impacts of climate change. Act now. Rally. Rethink. Respond. 
This message is brought to you by the OECS Secretariat with funded assistance from USAID. Did you know the Caribbean Court of Justice is two courts in one? The CCJ has two functions, an original jurisdiction, which deals with your right to move between CARICOM countries freely and your right to move your money and your business. This is the basis of the CARICOM Single Market and Economy, CSME, and the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, and an appellate jurisdiction to hear appeals from courts of those countries which decide to use it as their final court of appeal and no longer go to the Privy Council. All CARICOM member states who have signed the agreement establishing the CCJ are members of the CCJ. In studio discussions, Insight, Creole News, Road to the Throne, Calypso, Creole Festival, Carnival, and lots more local programming. See it all on the Government Information Service, your first for local news. independence, politics, and foreign affairs. Again, I want to thank so much these two esteemed gentlemen for joining me on the program tonight. And so, 